well, that was a rich romp through history. Uh, <laughs> it's um, actually very useful also to have a map when we're talking about this. It's sometimes hard to envision where things are. Um, let me ask you a question to begin. This was something that uh, you, we started with when, in talking about the young people, particularly in, in Egypt, but as well, of course, in Bahrain, in, in Syria, in Yemen, in all these countries, in Tunisia, where young people were very much at the forefront for all the reasons that you, that you raised. But here's a question. Um, there was a quote in a review of your, your new book, which really focuses on the millennials, a quote from Publishers Weekly, where they said, they started with a one sentence description of what the book is about, and they said, young people and their smartphones overthrew dictatorships. That was, uh, that was a pretty bold statement. Now, when I was in Egypt, about, uh, I guess it was about six weeks after Tahrir Square, after the overthrow of Mubarak, uh, I found that the people who were claiming the revolution as their own uh, were the taxi drivers and the minibus drivers, who said that when the regime's actions had led to the cell phones being cut off and the internet being cut off, they went back to kind of old-fashioned organizing, which was either in the mosques or person to person, which often meant somebody would get on a minibus and say, okay, today the plan is we're gonna be mobilizing at such and such a corner, and then we're gonna to march to so and so, tell everybody. And they'd get off and the driver would then tell everybody who got on, on board his car. So the question is, what we saw in the US coverage was very much about the centrality of the young people. How much of it was the young people and how much of it was young people with others and who were their allies who made that all possible? Yes, well, I, I actually do say in my book that the internet dimension of these youth revolutions uh, was vastly exaggerated. Um, and you know, when you first start as a writer, you think that it would be really great to have your book reviewed, and then you're, <laughs> yeah. you're under the impression that probably the person who reviewed it will have read all the way through it. Uh, so I had a number of reviewers who brought this up, about, but, but, but I, I went to some pains to say that this is a little bit of a myth. Uh, I think it, it's not unimportant, uh, and um, it's hard to put a, a number on its importance. But first of all, the youth certainly spearheaded these movements. Uh, that's very clear to me from my research. Uh, and uh, if you look at pictures of those crowds sure. in Tahrir Square or whatever, it's also young. very clear. It's, again, it's, it's, not, it's not that there weren't any middle-aged or older people there. Uh, it was multi-class. And... Um, However, I think a big important thing that happened was that the Muslim fundamentalists were mostly not involved in 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, in Tunisia, they'd been wiped out by the regime, and so they just weren't able to mobilize for revolution. In Egypt also, they were under very heavy police uh, surveillance, but their old man leadership also wasn't happy about the idea of revolution. They'd become junior partners with the regime, they had 88 seats in parliament out of 450. So th they thought they're doing all right, you know, with the status quo. And they didn't want a whole new status quo to emerge where maybe they'll be marginalized again and so forth. So they instructed their people not to get involved with this and including their youth. And uh, so we think about 25% is the estimates I found of the youth in Tahrir Square were Muslim Brotherhood. And they played an important role, but they were a small minority. And they, and they were, also, were bucking their elders that's what I was to be there. About. They, right. they weren't supposed to be joining in. Right. And a lot of them became disillusioned with the uh, fundamentalist brand of Islam and gradually you know, moved towards liberalism afterwards. Uh, and likewise in Syria, it was the youth, in, you know, it's the Syrian revolution began in the small southern town of Dera, which is kind of an agricultural uh, depot town. Uh, and it has a fair Christian population, but they had been the Baathi of the Baathists, you know. In the old days, they were very pro-regime, but there were water shortages, the regime wasn't giving them irrigation, uh, the young people weren't getting jobs. There were all these social discontents, so they started demonstrating uh, for dignity and so forth. And, uh, uh, and the regime said, well, this is Al-Qaeda. 
I mean, they, a lot of them are Christian, so like that's probably not true. Uh, and um, uh, they actually, I saw one demonstration in Dera, where it, it was like in April of 2011, the young people were holding signs uh, saying, Nahna Shabab Lesna Bil Qaeda. We're youth, we're not Al Qaeda. Uh, so, uh, but that was the regime propaganda was that this is terrorism and so forth. Uh, and likewise, elsewhere in, in, um, uh, in the region, in Yemen, youth played a, a really important role. Uh, and, and so I think it certainly was spearheaded by them. Uh, the, the internet was not irrelevant, but look, 1% of Egyptians were on Twitter in 2011, so it just couldn't have been that big a thing. Uh, Zainab Tufekci did some exit polling at Tahrir Square, mm -hmm. and she estimates that 25% of the people there said they found out about it by Facebook. Uh, but the rest uh, was face-to-face, -face, pamphleteering, you know, because they walked neighborhoods the way you walk neighborhoods for American elections. Uh, they walked neighborhoods uh, or uh, telephone calls from friends, uh, uh, SMS, you know, kind of phone messaging. Uh, so uh, that kind of smartphone thing, that, that was a minor part of it. Well, let me ask another aspect of, of what led to this regional phenomenon that became known as the Arab Spring. One has to do with climate change. Uh, particularly, I think this was clear in, in Syria when you had this drought that had driven, I think it was about 800,000 farmers off their land looking for jobs that hardly exist and the jobs that do exist tend to go to people who know somebody in, in power, which means that it's more likely to be an, an Alawite and therefore it becomes more sectarian than it had been. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the same thing in other countries where it becomes sectarian, in, in, in Bahrain where it was really a uh, youth-led, but a broader democratic uh, uprising, democratic demands, but because the majority of the population is Shia and the ruling family, the absolute monarchy, are, are Sunni, there's a conflict, so it becomes yes. sectarian. So how does the sectarianism emerge within this broader youth-led, the, the Arab millennials trying to take hold of their countries in this way? Yeah. Well, I, I, that's an excellent point. I certainly think that the, the, these conflicts are being driven by economic uh, considerations uh, and uh, the drought and climate change are part of that. Especially in Syria, although uh, this is happening in Egypt and, and uh, Libya as well, um, of course, droughts are cyclical. And, and this is an arid zone. The, right. the area from Morocco to the Gobi Desert is this massive arid zone uh, which is, is uh, produced by uh, the, our current uh, climate and weather conditions. Um, uh, you have warm, wet weather at the equator, right? So then this, this produces the, the dryness at the Sahara level. Um, and this has been going on for about 2,000 years. It's a long-term arid zone. So they have droughts time to time. It's cyclical. But uh, climate change has exacerbated the droughts in two ways. Uh, one is it's hotter. It's about a centigrade hotter now than it is uh, th th uh, than it was a hundred years ago. And heat exacerbates drought. It, may, it helps the water to evaporate and uh, it it's, uh, uh, makes the drought worse. Uh, so uh, this drought in Syria, had it happened a hundred years ago, would have been somewhat less severe than it is now just because it's now hotter. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that seems to be happening is that climate change is producing um, changes in the weather patterns so that the droughts are more frequent and longer lasting. This drought that we have in Syria has been going on uh, since like 2004, 2006. Mm -hmm. And as you say, the, the, the research on its effects are devastating. In the Al Jazeera area of eastern, northeastern Syria, uh, a study was done by a Finnish scholar that found that between 2006 and 2009, 70 percent of the farmers' livestock died of thirst. So, you know, livestock. If you if you know about farming, my my both my grandfathers were farmers. Your, your animals are a big part of your wealth as a farmer, uh, and. Uh, uh, they're stable, you know, the crops might come in that year or not, uh, but uh, if you've got cattle, you've got them, and uh, to have that many of their livestock die. 
certainly caused their farms to f fail in large numbers, and that's why you have this hundreds of thousands of people going right. to the cities in lo looking for jobs. And I told you about the Syrian economy, right? So how likely was it that they were going to find those jobs? And things were made worse by 2008, because whatever little bit of investment there might have been in building in Syria whoosh, went away. Uh, so uh, climate came into it there. But in other places, too, in, in Upper Egypt, uh, I found a lot of reports in the, in the Arabic press, which I don't see so much reported over here, of water shortages in villages. And to the extent that part of what the, uh, the, the Arab Spring was in Egypt was in these, in these upper Egyptian villages, uh, you know, there's a trunk road between Cairo and Aswan. And it's the major uh, artery of trade for that part of Egypt. Uh, and uh, they would bring uh, palm trees and donkey carts, and they would put them in the road and set them on fire and stop the trucks from going down to Aswan. Uh, until the governor of the province would come and talk to them. And then he would say, why are you doing this? What do you want? And they would you say, we've water. got no water in our village the last three weeks. You need to ship some in or rejigger the pipes or whatever. And I couldn't tell you, I couldn't figure out exactly what was going on that they were lacking water. Of course, uh, there is a problem with the flow of the Nile since they dammed it. And then the countries uh, upriver are damming. And uh, so that could be part of it. But my suspicion is that, you know, Mubarak uh, undid uh, Abdel Nasser's land reform to some extent, and people were starting to build back up these hacienda kind of estates, and I think they were stealing the peasants' water. Let's shift a little bit to the U.S. side of things, the U.S. policy side, the response to these crises. You spoke of the Obama administration's divides and the resistance of some parts of it to going back in, the pressure from others. I'm curious if you think in, in the debates over Syria, uh, which were late in the game relative to the others, how much did the failure of the Libya intervention play a role? Because you, at the time, you had, of course, the, the Libya intervention cheerleaders were in the State Department. Hillary Clinton, Samantha Power, Susan Rice were the, the pro-intervention forces that were apparently the most influential in convincing the president, who was quite resistant to accepting the, the European calls to go into Libya. So they go into Libya, as Hillary Clinton put it in her way, uh, we came, we saw, he died, uh, a rather crude way of talking about the, the um, destruction of the country as well as the, as the killing of Gaddafi. But the effect of that fairly quickly uh, collapsed into chaos with a huge amount of violence and a huge amount of weapons being distributed throughout the region, the crisis in Mali, all of that, coming back to Libya. So it was difficult to see Libya as anything but a failure fairly early on, even if you're living in the Washington bubble, I would say. although that does allow certain things to be believed. But I think even within the bubble, they had to see that what they had done in Libya had not necessarily made things better. In the, how much did that reality play a role in Obama's hesitation to once again do what, what uh, Einstein had defined as the definition of crazy, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result? How much was Libya part of his reluctance? I think his reluctance was probably more grounded in the Iraq experience uh, than in the Libyan one. Because Libya was contemporaneous with, with Syria. And uh, while obviously it did go very bad, I actually would argue that it wasn't really clear how bad it was going until about 2013. Uh, and I was there in 2012, by the way, and, and you couldn't, I mean, they had successful parliamentary elections. You could. You couldn't tell the, uh, where it might go. Uh, so it was, it, was, um, uh, it was 2013 when the militias uh, started going at one another. But I think, I think uh, it probably affected Obama in other ways, the Libyan experience. First of all, he didn't want to go into Libya. Uh, what was leaked from, from his office at the time was he called it a turd sandwich, I think was the term he used. Um, 
even yeah. less enthusiastic than uh, <laughs> right, right. There was no enthusiasm. Uh, you are. <laughs> no, there was and, no enthusiasm. Uh, that's clear. But he did it. That's he, the well. Yes. Ultimately, he, he, that's he did do it. Uh, uh, Bob Gates didn't want to. You know, the hardline Secretary of Defense was right. was against it right. and so forth. Right. But I, I think what it was was that Cameron, the Prime Minister of of, uh, of Britain, uh, David Cameron, and the uh, President of France, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy really, really wanted to do this thing. And I, I can't tell you why exactly. It's odd. And I mean, the Italians I think, I, uh, played a very big role. But, but actually, Berlusconi didn't want Libya. It wasn't Berlusconi, no, but, but, it, but it, it was Italian, the Italian military, the business. Yeah, I mean, there was a big move because of fear of refugees. Uh, yeah, I know. Um, the Europeans were the... afraid that, that Libya would turn into Syria, which it could have. You know, it's not quite. It's like half of Libyans are not homeless and so forth. So. Uh, they were afraid that maybe it would have a big, big refugee crisis. I think Sarkozy thought if he had a success in Libya that it might help him to get reelected. I think it was that, I think that's that crude. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. and as for camera, I don't know. I have no idea. It may be something to do with BP. Uh, but uh, in any case, I asked a, I asked a European diplomat uh, who shall remain nameless, I said, why did they want this so badly? Uh, because it was always risky. And he said, ah, Libya, he said, Libya. Libya is a Viagra for dying empires. Okay, okay that's, that's a, it's a good line on that yeah. one. I, I've so got to Obama say. actually appears to have thought that if he did this for, because basically what he did was to take out Gaddafi's anti-aircraft uh, uh, right. batteries, that if for he did French. that for the French and the British, that they would own Libya. And then it would be their responsibility, build back up the army, you know, set it on a good footing, and, and so forth. And, and then he looked as dim, in dismay as they, this has nothing to do with us. You, you went into Libya. It's your and, responsibility. And so, yeah, and, so, and then Hillary appears, also Hillary Clinton appears to have done nothing with regard. I mean, I would have, uh, I'm not in the policy world, and I don't get to make these decisions, but if you came to me and said, Okay, it's, it's Libya 2012, Gaddafi's gone, there is a, an elected parliament, there's a prime minister, there's not much of an army left because it was overthrown uh, and so forth. What does the country need? Well, it needs security. So what two things would you need to do is train up a new army, take some officers over to NATO for training, some enlisted men, uh, train them in, in tactics and so forth, and find a way to get the militiamen to join that army and disarm so that you have a line of command. Because these militiamen were just volunteers. Well, let me challenge you but on that. But the U.S. didn't do that. No, but look what has happened when the U.S. did do that. This is exactly what they did in Syria. The idea that we can, it's, it's not post-conflict in the same way, but the idea that the U.S. can create a militia, train them, arm them, and that they will somehow be able to bring stability to the country. It's what we did in oh, Iraq. Oh, no. But I'm not talking about militias. It's, I'm talking about a regular army. You're talking about creating reports to the an prime army. minister. Right. But that's assuming that it's a prime minister who actually has support of more than a very small number but, of people in the country. All, all, look, um, my friend Fred Cooper, who studies African decolonization in the 40s and 50s, pointed out to me, he said, whenever these countries go into a place like Iraq or Libya nowadays, essentially they're, they're replicating at a fast pace the colonial experience. And they're basically putting in themselves in a situation where they have to decolonize. So all successful decolonization involves the things that I said. You look at Kenya, you look at any of these post-colonial countries that amounted to anything, they came out of it with a trained bureaucracy and a trained army and, and, a, and a government with some legitimacy. And they all had been ruled by British or French or something. All I'm saying, if you were gonna go into Libya you can't go in there and then just walk away from it. And all three right. of the major countries that were involved here walked away from it. Okay, I think th there's always questions about what does walking away mean? Does it mean walking away militarily? Does it mean walking away economically? What do we owe to these countries? This was something I think that came up a lot in the early stages of the Iraq War when Colin Powell was running around with his pottery barn analogy saying, we broke it, we own it, so we have to fix it. And it becomes a justification for continued occupation, where you could argue, I think, that, I mean, what I was arguing at the time was that this was really the wrong analogy, that the, the, the analogy is not Pottery Barn, but it's the bull in the china shop. 
what do you do when the bull gets loose in the china shop and breaks all the cups? Yeah, yeah. You don't send the bull back well, to fix the cups. Well, I, I, was, I, was on the, I was on the same side as you with regard, uh, I thought it was a very bad idea to go into Iraq. Uh, right. All that I'm saying is that if you were going to establish a no-fly zone over Libya and arrange for its government to fall, then uh, just having nothing further to do with it is unwise. Uh, and and I, I don't accept the Agreed. argument that nothing can be done. There have been a lot of these post-conflict situations where you know it doesn't have to be imperial powers. It doesn't have to right. involve troops on the ground or occupation. We had the African Union with a plan for how to deal with Somebody Libya. Somebody should and, have done something. Right. Well, all and that I'm saying is that I think right. Obama's probably took away from Libya the firm idea that Cameron and Sarkozy and, and King Sal, well, it wasn't Salman, it was Abdullah at the time in, in Saudi Arabia, all of these guys would very much like the U.S. to do their work for them. Right. But then in the aftermath, you, you know, you're like, Custer, you look behind you and <laughs> nobody there. And, and, and so I, th I think he became more and more reluctant to get involved with Syria precisely because he didn't expect the international community, uh, as they call it, to... to help him in any way, and it would, then he would have to own Syria. So that's why I'm saying, when the Russians offered him a way out, uh, he, he took it e immediately. And um, uh, the one piece of this that, as you can tell, I don't understand is that uh, he, he mostly stayed out of Syria except to bomb ISIL. And you know, you can bomb or you can bomb. Uh, they fly sorties. Uh, don't pay any attention to that number. I'm an army brat. I want to tell you. Sortie means they, they went out with the plane. It doesn't mean that they dropped anything. So a bombing raid is different. There's actual strikes. They were making like 22 strikes uh, a, a day on, on Mosul and ISIL and, and, uh, and Raqqa. This is not serious. I mean, I would say not that going some of the civilians fall. that were killed by it might have thought it was serious, well, but there's always it didn't been, have yeah, that much impact yeah, but, but on ISIS. It's, it's, it's never, right. well, and that's why it was unwise. I agree. You, you never want Certainly. to bomb places. Uh, again, being an army brat, I, I just have to warn you, I don't know if there are Air Force people here. Uh, they're, they're wonderful people, but they're, they're wrong. They, they think that you can win wars by bombing. And they told us if we only bombed, you know, carpet bombed Vietnam, we would win. And uh, if we bombed North Vietnam enough, they would surrender. And then there was that shock and awe. Remember shock and awe? Wouldn't have to invade Iraq at all. You just bomb it so much that they would just they would like give up. give up. And it never works unless you are bombing in support of grunts, of troops on the ground that are taking territory. Then you shouldn't be bombing. And this is what, I, what my, my point was that the only involvement that Obama has actually had in, in Syria has been a, these lackadaisical occasional bombing risks, which must be for public opinion. It's Absolutely. nothing to do with military uh, right. uh, advances. They just kill people in the meantime. Yeah. But we have only a couple more minutes. Let me ask you a, a final question here. You said that you're not in the policy field, but we are in the midst of an election, and we are going to have a new president at some point. Um, what would be your advice in a minute or two of what they should do? What they should do? Yeah. Well, you know, I think that Obama's initial instincts that the U.S. is overly entangled in the Middle East were correct. I think uh, he, one forgets, you know, he was in Hawaii and then he was a community organizer in Chicago, and it's not like he knew a lot about these things. Uh, I'm, and uh, he's an intelligent man in a quick study, but I think he still, his instinct is still that of a community organizer. He, he thinks if you could just get people around the table, you could talk out their problems. Uh, and, and you see this in the recent negotiations in Syria. And uh, it's not like that. Like the Saudis really, really, really hate the Iranians, and they want to kill them. And they want to overthrow the Syrian government because it's allied with with Iran, and they expect the United States to help them to do that or else they'll be mad at us and they'll make our gasoline expensive or take revenge on us in some way. So it's, the, the region is not full of you know, reasonable people, who, the re leaders who would like to sit around a table and find some common ground. It's, it's full of people who want to win, and they want to win by, you know, that uh, old movie uh, about George Patton, they, they quoted the general as saying that 
uh, I don't want you to die for your country like some fool. You want to make the other fool die for his country. Well, that's pretty much how they think about it. And the next president shouldn't get drawn into those internecine uh, Middle Eastern uh, struggles just because we're traditionally allies with the country doesn't mean that all of their struggles are our struggles. Uh, we, we have our own national interests. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, the Lannan Foundation. Uh, I think in a few minutes you'll be able to meet us out in the lobby and have a look at Juan's book and mine as well, and book signing will be available. So thank you all very much for coming tonight. <laughs>